Hi, this is Devin Foley, the Charlemagne Institute, and uh, today is another back channel. Happens to be on the anniversary of 9/11, uh, and which unleashed a lot of war that my generation saw. Uh, today, though, we are here with Serja Trifkovich, who has been the foreign affairs editor of Chronicles magazine uh, since 1998, which is fantastic. His insights are unique and uh, very much an example of Chronicles magazine and Charlemagne Institute and uh, our perspective on uh, much of America's foreign policy and global affairs. Today, he'll be talking about the Indo-Pacific and what the future of war could be. Uh, just uh, overnight, India and China decided they would have somewhat of an agreement and uh, bring hostilities down. But at the same time, we still have issues with the U.S. and South China Sea and China and competing interests. And Sergey is here to, to talk about all of that. So, Sergey, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, for our viewers, if you have questions, don't forget, we are on the uh, Chronicles Facebook page. Ask your questions there, and uh, we'll we'll filter and put them up for uh, Sergio. Also on Intellectual Takeout's Facebook page, our Charlemagne Institute YouTube page. And if you don't want to put questions there, feel free to email at contact at charlemagneinstitute.org. So thank you so much that. Sergio, I'll hand it over to you. What do you see out there? Oh, where to start? Uh, when talking about uh, the tricky issue of U.S. relations with China, we need to bear in mind that three years ago, uh, President Donald Trump coined the phrase Indochina region which until that time was known as China Pacific. So he tried to expand the geopolitical vision of the area that surrounds China to its southwestern pivot, the Indian subcontinent, and also through the development of a close relationship with the Indian uh, Prime Minister Modi to treat this uh, relationship as the possible kernel of a future alliance, alliance that might even have the military character. Now, it makes a lot of sense for a uh, status quo power like the United States, which of course being the most powerful in the world, does not want regional competitors to go beyond their station, uh, to try and develop alliances that will keep the surging power in check. But in this case, it's rather tricky because even though both China and India are not exactly friends, even though there are certain civilizational, cultural, and uh, geopolitical political incompatibilities, it is still remarkable that you have these two giants, China with an estimated 1.45, close to one and a half billion people, India with 1.375, between them they have close to 3 billion people. Uh, still, they have not fought a major war. They did have a border war in 1962 with India being barely beaten under uh, the Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru in a disputed border area. But when you look at the history of Europe, when you look at uh, the empires of uh, Persia versus the Greeks, of uh, uh, Alexander the Great versus the Persians, and so on through history, uh, Rome versus Carthaginian uh, Telesocratic Empire. Uh, it's really remarkable. I apologize, I suffer from allergies right now. It's really remarkable that China and India 
the two Asian giants have managed through many centuries of close contact to avoid an overt war. The Chinese have always expanded only within the limits of what the Confucian teaching uh, regarded as normal, which is to say what you can absorb into your statehood, what you can tax, and what you can turn into your own, the Han Chinese. It's truly remarkable that, that the borders of China have not really changed a lot over the centuries. Because if you look at the borders of, say, Poland, Poland and, and Lithuania were, as Commonwealth, the most powerful and most spacious state in Europe, except for the Moscow Principality, in the 16th century. Two centuries later, Poland disappears from the political map of Europe, and it goes on. In the Far East and in the Indian subcontinent, this remarkable stability means that today, as the United States increasingly perceives China as an existential rival and a threat to its security, India becomes important. The importance of India is that if you look at the map, and after all, geography is destiny, and I passionately believe in the importance of geopolitics, India stands right smack in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and even though traditionally it has been more uh, land power than sea power, her importance for the sea lanes leading from the Straits of Malacca and Singapore in the east to the Suez Canal in the west is paramount. And for the United States in long term, it's very important if the task is to contain China's ray, uh, ray, rise to the status of first-rate power to see what to do with India. Because India is reluctant to be tied to any kind of alliance. At the same time, India is wary of China's uh, rising prominence. Oh, that's fascinating. So, as far as the U.S. role in that and the sea lane issue, you know, when looking at the South China Sea, the ability of the U.S. to rely on our aircraft carriers to project power, things of that nature. I know uh, China recently showed off or tested its anti-carrier missiles, things of that nature. What do you... What do you see for the future of the U.S. to project power in that region? Uh, and is that necessarily uh, not the worst thing? <laughs> I'm very glad you asked the question because uh, very often, if we look at history, the change of military technology and the change of weapons design has resulted in the change of geopolitical uh, strategies, and the Chinese right now have uh, colloquially called carrier killer missiles with a range of around 2,000 2, to 2,500 2, kilometers, that's between 1,200 and 1,500 miles, which are very cheap relatively speaking, compared to a carrier that costs 12 billion and carries 5,500 soldiers, uh, uh, naval personnel. Uh, it is no longer possible for carrier-based groups to sail into the South China Sea if the crisis gets serious. Additional problem is that the range of carrier-based aircraft is up to 800 miles. At the same time, uh, with the development of these Chinese missiles that uh, can 
herd carriers, it's twice that much. So we are looking at a weapon system that is becoming as obsolete as the battleship was obsolete at the beginning of World War II. Uh, maybe not many of our listeners will know this, but the British sailed two battleships without air cover out of Singapore in December of 1941, shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. They were the Prince of Wales and Repulse. And both were sunk off the coast of Malaya by land-based Japanese uh, fighters, fighter bombers, sorry. And uh, that was, in, in effect, the end of the battleship. Because, as we know, the following year, the Battle of Midway was fought without either side ever sighting a ship of the enemy on the horizon. It was completely fought in the air. And uh, likewise, I really feel that fighting China in order to prevent her rise as a first-rate power is futile. China does not want global hegemony. At the same time, China is quietly contemptuous of foreigners, basically, uh, whether under uh, the emperors or under uh, Kuomintang and uh, in Chiang Kai-shek or Mao Zedong or his successors, they still view all of us, Europeans, Americans, non-Chinese, as barbarians. The Middle Kingdom is the epitome of civilized statehood as it should be. And uh, the Confucian teaching is based upon the notion of stability, harmony, and the balance between costs and benefits. Of course, within the Confucian paradigm, it's possible to have adventurous uh, expansion, like in, into the South Chinese Sea, with the militarization of, of and, uh, and uh, you know, and the development of military bases on, on the atolls and the islands. But the Chinese played for the long term. They see themselves as rightfully called upon to be a prime, if not the only civilized power in the world, without necessarily controlling physically the space. And this is the difference. The US has military bases all over the world, which do not pay dividends. What is the purpose of the United States having a base in, at Rammstein near Frankfurt or Würzburg, I know Germany very well, uh, at the time when the Cold War is over and, uh, and the possibility of the Russian army uh, coming across Belarus and Poland into Germany, is, it's, it's absurd. The Chinese see control in terms of tribute. Uh, in the old days, Paying tribute to the Chinese emperor was often symbolic. It was not necessarily uh, a, a great deal in monetary terms, but for the Chinese, it epitomized their understood, implied, and accepted superiority. To counter that, the United States has to decide whether South China Sea, Taiwan, Guam, and the status of Tibet, the status of Uttar Pradesh, and, and various other disputed points along the border between China and India are vital U.S. interests. I have always been, for the past 20 plus years, as, as you mentioned, as the writer for Chronicles, the advocate of hard-nosed realism. It doesn't matter to the security and prosperity and internal cohesion of the United States 
whose flag flies over Taipei. It does matter a great deal whether we are exporting our productive capacity to Chinese factories because of the misguided and short-sighted uh, obsession of US companies with profit. It does matter a great deal whether they have the capacity by selling billions and billions of dollars of US Treasury bonds to undermine the dollar and undermine the US economy. So I'm trying to <laughs> wrap up in a long-winded way, I'm afraid, uh, a basic question. There is no existential conflict between the US and China. There is no need to risk a major war for the sake of the freedom of, of navigation between some godforsaken islands in the South China Sea. On the other hand, there is a great deal to be gained by shortening uh, the supply chains and reinvigorating domestic industry, which has been exported to uh, Guangdong and, and various other industrial areas of, of the Chinese Republic. There's a lot there. The, uh, to your point, coming off of the, with the Chinese in the South China Sea, I'd been seeing reports of, you know, the, the islands that they were creating, the military bases, uh, at least for the last 10, maybe even 15 years. Uh, I just, I, they were popping up and people were warning about it and showing that the Chinese would be able to project their power into that area and that the South China Sea would effectively be their own uh, Mediterranean in a, in a sense. The U.S. then, uh, to your point of the dollar, you know, we're in a time where the spending, uh, the debt-based spending, the bailouts, everything is going through the roof. Looking at the Chinese, to your point, uh, their methodical and uh, efforts as well as patience, what do you see realistically for them trying to unseat the U.S. dollar? Uh, that would strike me as the biggest blow against the U.S. that you could deliver. Before we come to that, we have to consider the reality that the United States right now is a deeply divided society in which, uh, to put it crudely, the deplorables on the one side, the pickup truck driving, six pack, uh, Bud Light drinking, uh, good old boys, and the coastal elites look at each other as not members of one nation which shares uh, the long-term destiny of sorts, of any sort. Whereas the Han Chinese, who form 95% of the population, so the remaining 5% are the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, the Tibetans, and so on, uh, really partake in the sense of collective endeavor to be uh, a first-rate power. With the Han Chinese right now, we are actually witnessing the sort of uh, national revival that was typical of European in the early 19th century, uh, the, the time of romantic nationalism, the rise of nationalism in Germany was due to Napoleonic occupation in uh, the early 1800s. And then, of course, it all came to fruition in the revolutionary year of 1848. The sense that we are one nation based upon the continuity of historical memory and blood and language and myths. In China, even, it, it is not the same language because, of course, Cantonese and Mandarin and Hakka are very different, but 
the script is the same and it is the binding cement. In the United States, by contrast, we have so uh, fundamentally different narratives about who we are and what we are. <laughs> I am a naturalized American who became American on the basis of a certain understanding of truly impressive achievement of the founding fathers. We are looking at uh, uh, the population base of seven or eight million, and we are looking at people of enormous talent who produced uh, a, an experiment in statehood and nationhood that I could gladly identify with. But today, we have these deconstructivist and, uh, frankly, uh, uh, utterly uh, uh, destructivist forces that are tearing it apart, that really want to turn the United States into not a proposition nation for uh, the universal values of what is a common denominator, denominator by, uh, for humanity, but into the experiment in uh, postmodern uh, cultural Marxist, and I'm deviating from the subject, excuse me, cultural Marxist uh, theory of replacing the capitalist with white heterosexual Christian male and the exploited laborer, uh, the proletarian, with uh, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, illegal immigrant Muslim woman of color. In that situation, the Chinese have an inherent advantage because the Chinese are dealing with a state that is based upon a fairly clearly defined mission of the Han Chinese majority, 90 plus percent, I, re I repeat, among whom dissent practically doesn't exist. They perceive the mission of the Communist Party in the same way they would have perceived the mission of Kuomintang had uh, Chiang Kai-shek won the civil war in 1949, because the Kuomintang today, uh, 70 years later, would not have behaved in any way different to the Communist Party. There is absolutely no ingredient of Marxist orthodoxy in the Chinese Communist Party uh, Weltanschauung, the view of the world, just as there was none in the Kuomintang, which still, by the way, is present in Taiwan. Both see China as the rightful center of the universe, the most civilized country in the world, and the country which, after a shameful century of uh, more than a century, it started uh, in the first Opium War, which the, uh, the British uh, imposed on China in uh, 1839, until the victory of Mao in, in the Chinese Civil War in 1949. So, we are not at all looking at ideologically based notion of Chinese Communist Party as some kind of subversive force that wants to overturn the world order. We are looking at a traditional striving for what the Chinese perceive as their rightful place at the table. And that rightful place, by the way, includes the projection of soft power to such an extent that they have purchased uh, a made majority stake in the, in the port of Piraeus in Greece as the entry point to uh, Central Europe, all over Africa, and of course the United States Department of State can scream uh, as much as they want that this is 
self-centered uh, and self-serving plan, but for a developing nation, when someone says, we'll be, build a, a four-lane highway and, and a railway, like from Mombasa to, to uh, Nairobi, and you can repay it in good time at favorable rate, what are the investors from elsewhere who will say, never mind that, we'll, we'll give you a better offer? There is no better offer because the Chinese know that uh, by playing the economic hand and by projecting their soft power, let me mention Confucius Institute's extensive e e uh, cultural exchange, academic exchange, they know what they're doing. Uh, what they fail to perceive is that sometimes they try to do too much too soon. And this is the case with Hong Kong. I don't believe that uh, the opposition in Hong Kong is a threat to the concept of one nation, two systems. I don't believe that even within Hong Kong itself, the majority is in favor of defying Beijing, I think they've re overreacted. And likewise, I think that uh, uh, it would make a lot of sense from the realist standpoint in foreign policy terms for the Chinese to hold and assist in the South China Sea, simply enjoy the fruits of their successes thus far, and let the US carry out what they call freedom of navigation exercises. But in global terms, let's not kid ourselves. The United States accounted for 40% of global economy in 1965. Today, it's just over 20%. So it's less than half that. China accounted back in the 60s for 3% of global economy, and now it's, it's close to 20%. These changes need to be reflected in geopolitical balances. China wants to break out of uh, what it regards as the cage of the Malaccan Straits, Straits of Malacca. China wants to develop uh, uh, the route through Pakistan to the Arabian Sea on one side, the west side of India, and through Burma. I hate uh, the name Myanmar, which is politically correct for Burma. On the other side, let them do it. Why is that a threat to the US? The Chinese, with 1.4, 1, maybe 1.5 billion people, were talented, intelligent, industrious, is not, historically speaking, a global power. It always seeks to pro project power regionally. It wants to have uh, tributary states in Southeast Asia, on the Korean Peninsula, and elsewhere. But there is no way that China, even upsurgent and, and rich as it is becoming, will threaten the security of the United States, which is the most secure great power in history, protected on both sides by oceans, to the north by a pliant, uh, you know, non-entity called Canada, and to the south by potentially resentful, but on the whole inept and, uh, and uh, very often a uh, ridiculous country called Mexico, which had it not exported all of these uh, uh, unemployables to the US would have collapsed a long time ago. Uh, so much to discuss in there. The, the heaviness that's in the air in the US uh, currently, I think, I, I mean, here in Minneapolis, we've seen a huge swaths burn and destroy. Uh, Flare-ups, we've seen it in Wisconsin. Portland is going on. It's a uh, hundred and some odd day rioting. And there seems to be, to your point, 
that the U.S. in the coming years stands a strong chance of having serious internal unrest and tensions. In that, what do you see for the the rest of the world if the U.S. finds itself distracted tremendously on the domestic side? Is there a reshuffling? Is that a time where you see big changes coming? Well, first of all, I think that for the United States, it would be a very good idea to give up the notions of global empire. Because if we look through history, no country that was the bearer of an imperial project ever uh, profited from the endeavor. Uh, a notable example is Spain under Philip II in uh, the closing decades of the 16th century, when Spain was literally the biggest empire the world had ever known, even bigger than uh, Rome, because uh, with the gold mines and silver from uh, Mexico and Peru and today's Bolivia, with the control of the oceans, it seemed to be the true hegemon. And yet, within decades, by the end of the 30-year war in Europe in 1648, the Peace of Westphalia, Spain had declined to number four. Uh, the British Empire, again, it was not even based on ideological notions like uh, the US tries to uh, always uh, compose its narrative around uh, the story of human rights and uh, and uh, uh, free trade and uh, democracy, blah, blah. The British were hard-nosed about it. And they had a chain of calling stations, Gibraltar, Malta, Suez, Aden, India, Singapore, and so on. Uh, the British are remarkable in that they accepted their imperial decline without a war, because to them it, it was always based on money, basically, and, the, and there was no sense of existential crisis if you have to give up, uh, give up on aid and give up on Suez, etc. In the United States, we have a problem in that the mix of uh, millenarian uh, Puritan tradition on the one side, shining city on the hill, New Jerusalem, uh, the example, the light to the world. I think for a lot of us as you know, Americans, you grow up with, we're America. You know, my grandfather, he fought in World War II. You learn the glories of World War II, of Midway, you <laughs> our creation of uh, nuclear weapons and our dominance in so many different areas. And it does seem that there's a lot of hubris that we have. There's yes. just a, an almost belief that even, even you see it in the politics, there's almost a... Yes. a a, a sense that, well, nothing will ever happen to us and nothing, we will never be humiliated and we'll always be free and we don't need to take things seriously. In the First World War, uh, Woodrow Wilson never managed to imbue the nation with this millenarian sense of we are creating a new world. And even though he said that was the war to end all wars, the war for democracy, when push came to shove, U.S. Congress refused to ratify uh, the Versailles Treaty and, uh, and the League of Nations Convent. So back then, the United States was very briefly in a position to become the hegemon of the new world order uh, at Versailles and stepped back from it. In uh, the aftermath of the, World, uh, the Second World War, however, we had a situation where uh, 
the sense that we saved the world, that we were the uh, saviors, and that we have a special responsibility, even though it was not as ideologically strongly stated as it had been by Woodrow Wilson in his 14 points in, in January in, uh, 1918, very quickly morphed into the notion that we have the responsibility for everyone. It started with the Truman Doctrine in uh, March 1947, when he extended U.S. security guarantees to Greece and Turkey. That was the first time in history that the United States uh, guaranteed the security of a country outside the Western Hemisphere. A uh, Marshall Plan followed, which arguably saved Europe from communism and collapse, because as we know, it provided the basis for security and uh, economic recovery. However, today, the United States is no longer a model for the world, either in terms of a uh, democratic system, which is based upon the manipulation of democracy by vested interests and by uh, powerful ingredients within the system that already have preordained objectives and then they only want to manipulate the outcome on the one side and on the other by the fact that the United States needs to redefine its identity. Uh, ask a Serb, a Russian, a Chinese, or even West European allies of the United States, a, a, a Spaniard, an Irishman, or a Norwegian. What is the basis of American identity? If you listen to the Democratic Party, it is uh, subscribing to universal, or what they call, or allege to be universal values of anti-discriminationism, inclusiveness, uh, uh, free development of, of each and every form of sexual and every other identity. If you look at traditional America, uh, country music, listening, pickup truck driving, Bud Light drinking, uh, Lucky Strike smoking America, called deplorables by, by Hillary Clinton, it is still rooted in the soil, in the remembrance of fathers and grandfathers, in the pride of belonging to it, and in the determined stand not to allow my land to be overtaken by multitudes that share no uh, identity and, and no sympathy even for my legacy. So if you look at uh, illegal immigration, the notion that anyone who crosses the Rio Grande or manages to sneak through at JFK International or uh, LAX is automatically fit to become an American is absurd, because if we are talking about nationhood, and again, as naturalized American, I'm talking about what I identify with is the sense that the founding fathers, uh, the language, the culture, the, the music, the literature, the continuity of uh, development of a nation that expanded steadily across the first mountain range, the Appalachians, to the rivers, and then across the Mississippi into the Rockies and to uh, the Pacific Ocean, the nation that left unresolved uh, the war between the states uh, without demonizing either side and try to unify and blend them both, <laughs> uh, is the beauty of 
something that one can both project abroad and build upon at home. What the other side is doing is destroying the uh, foundations of it, not because it wants to build a better America, but because it wants to destroy any notion of society based upon the continuity of historical memories, linguistic and cultural ties, songs and myths, and the notion of transcendence. These people hate family, they hate nationhood, they hate tradition, they hate church, they hate belief in God. I, I think that uh, we have a wonderful paradigmatic example of what they stand for in George Soros, who is, as a uh, young teenager at the age of 15, pretending to be a Gentile in the summer of 1944, when uh, 800,000 Hungarian Jews were taken to the death camps, uh, went around uh, with a Hungarian official telling him which pieces of Jewish property need to be sequestered and confiscated. George Soros is the resonated postmodern mogul who has been spreading mischief on both sides of the Atlantic for decades. But in the United States, uh, I must admit, I'm surprised that the success has been so uh, corrosively uh, spectacular that we have this schism, this, this gap between two Americas that we have today. That's a, that's a good point. I tell you, you know, what I have seen out there, I have uh, one friend, many friends who were in Iraq or Afghanistan, one friend lost an arm. Uh, another friend uh, earned a uh, bronze star in Iraq and then was on a second deployment to Afghanistan. Uh, his vehicle was hit by an IED. His back was broken. You know, my generation has a very uh, uh, big distaste for what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and the waste of blood and treasure there. And at the same time, I see this tremendous outpouring of patriotism, a wanting of America to be great, but also an idea of America not projecting power all across the world. At the same time, it seems that our diplomatic corps, our uh, intelligence officers, our uh, ambassadors and other air individuals very much coming from one of the coasts they seem to want to continue America's projection of power, not out of some, it, it, that there's a lot of money there and there's a lot of influence that they can have. Do you see, how do you see this conflict working its way out with, on the foreign policy side? Uh, do we, are we humiliated uh, because of the pride of the diplomatic corps and their seeming belief that we can pop in and out of any country we want or send drones or project power, all of these things? Uh, or do you see the patriotic, uh, you know, Americans who've been burned by the Iraq and Afghanistan war uh, being able to secure and hold power? Well, uh, first of all, when we talk about uh, the Department of State, we need to be clear that it is... Uh, uh, hotbed of uh, hegemonistic full spectrum dominance ideology. Uh, they really subscribe to not only the notion of America's uh, the policeman of the world, no, the social worker and uh, the therapist of the world. It started, and I would say, the cutting point was in 2009 when Barack Obama, with the full support of, of his diplomatic service, announced that uh, homosexual rights 
are a major uh, foreign policy concern of the United States. This was in complete contrast with uh, traditional diplomacy and, and international relations, because uh, traditionally you seek to increase your power and your security and, and, and your economic prosperity through uh, uh, transactional relationships which sometimes hit a brick wall, like during the Cold War, when you had standoffs all over the world. Sometimes you make successes like Western Europe under the Marshall Plan in the aftermath of World War II. But all of a sudden, in 2009, and I don't want to say that this is a pivotal moment, but at least we are talking about a very specific policy issue that had consequence, you start insisting that uh, various countries should stage gay pride parades, notably in Moscow, which didn't happen, in Belgrade, which did happen to the great deal of internal dissent and, uh, and the sense of alienation and animosity from many people who otherwise <laughs> would have been friendly to the United States. So this was a very clear example of the disconnect between what one can call a realist foreign policy, which is based upon the notion of uh, security, prosperity, and uh, cultural uh, and, and uh, uh, economic presence in, in the world, an ideologically driven minority issue that even within, within the United States cannot by any t means be called, you know, uh, something that you have consensus about. Uh, to come back to your question, uh, the Roman Empire <coughs> was able to project a desirable model of social, cultural, and economic life that even to the conquered nations and lands and tribes was so important and so attractive that St. Paul in his epistles, as we know, insisted, I am a Roman citizen. Uh, except for uh, the rebellion of the Jews in the first century AD, uh, all over North Africa and then along the Lemus from Scotland to the Rhine, the De lower Danube and Mesopotamia, the Romans were not only powerful, but culturally attractive. Uh, I myself visited various Roman uh, remnants in Tunisia, in Libya, in, uh, in Asia Minor, in southern Turkey. Everywhere you had uh, the baths, theaters, and forai. And that was not imposed. That was gladly accepted in Hibernia, in uh, Lusitania, in, uh, you know, today's Portugal, in, in, in Spain, etc. You had the model of governance and the model of cultural superiority that was looked upon as worthy of emulation and worthy of imitation. So that even after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, of course, it survived in the East, in Constantinople. You had these funny barbarians putting on togas and calling themselves Holy Roman Empire, emperors. The difference today is that the American model of governance with its obvious internal divisions that cannot be argued rationally because they're on the verge of violence and that differ uh, in, in terms of what is America for one half or close to one half, it's an inherently racist, unjust society based upon 
white privilege and, and, uh, and subjugation of minorities. For the other half, it is the shining city on the hill and so on. There is no unified notion of what we stand for. And again, I must say, as a, a naturalized American, I am totally 100% behind that model of society developed by the founding fathers and the old republic, which I believe is still the best and the brightest and uh, the goodest model uh, the world has ever known. However, what we are facing on the other side is so dark, so I'm reluctant to use uh, moral terms, but I'll say it, so evil that it harks to the dark times of the French Revolution, the guillotine and Robespierre of Lenin and the Red Terror. Unfortunately, I agree with you. Uh, not even ten. But completely agree with you. And uh, the what we are facing are people who seem to believe that for their liberation requires our destruction. And uh, it is it is not a uh, a situation that any of us are pleased to see whatsoever and we're fighting very hard against uh, especially I've got six kids and you know my oldest is coming up on 17 and another 15 and that's fighting age and uh, definitely a lot of worries out there we have uh, there were a variety of questions I was asking thinking about you know as you talked about the model of America that we seem to be exporting it seems to be that what we've switched over to exporting, uh, there's the social justice warrior side, but it seems consumers, you know, I'm fascinated by the example of Buick in China, that the Chinese see Buick as uh, something to aspire towards and sort of uh, these American-ish, uh, you know, consumer items and symbols that they're grabbing onto uh, and you know here at home not too many people are driving Buicks but GM keeps them alive yeah. with that uh, you know can you speak to to that is that all we have left is consumerism and Hollywood as far as our exportation uh, or and then and how what is the road back well uh, <laughs> It's hard to answer that, but let me tell you, I, I was born in 1954 in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, in what was well, a communist dictatorship headed by Tito, even though it wasn't a typical Soviet-style dictatorship, but it was a one-party state, it was not a free state. The difference was, for instance, that they allowed American films to be shown. And uh, uh, as 11, 12, 13 year old, watching, you know, North, Northwest, uh, High Noon, Gary Cooper, uh, Humphrey Bogart, etc. Uh, that truly indoctrinated me, <laughs> quote unquote. And and main be desirous of all things American, far more powerfully than I think any of these postmodern uh, paps uh, offered to the rest of the world can do today. So America was exporting itself in a powerful cultural way 50 years ago without even planning or uh, desiring to do so because it was its true self. And in answer to your question, it can no longer do so today unless there is a day of reckoning because some of your listeners may not like my uh, final uh, diagnosis, but the gap between the evil in Portland and elsewhere 
and uh, the desire of most heartland Americans for a quiet, normal life cannot be resolved without violence. It will be <laughs> what Lenin in uh, in the Russian language called "kto kog," who gets whom. Uh, I believe that Donald Trump will win the election, but I also believe that it will be disputed by those who will try uh, their utmost to uh, turn uh, inner cities into battleground uh, zones. And uh, unless the notion of both law and order and responsibility for respect of constitutional and legal norms is reinforced with an iron hand that uh, we are on to, to a very green future because uh, treating laws as flexible and uh, uh, amenable to uh, interpretation on the basis of ideological preferences as someone born in communism, I know where it leads. It leads to uh, the principle that uh, your status in the society is dependent on your socioeconomic, cultural and political preferences, and that uh, the same laws will not allow, uh, will not apply to African Americans, Latinos, Anglos, Jews, etc. Uh, they will be applied strictly dependent upon their status on the pecking order and ideological preferences of those who have power. That is dangerous. That is the road to tyranny. And that is the road to the collapse of uh, society. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, my stomach's been shrinking these days, considering the options and seeing the rhetoric out there about the election. I, uh, I also agree with you on that point, and it's very sobering. What would you say, Sergio, to the people who see uh, a Trump sweep uh, as the salvation for the country if Trump were to win in a very, very big way, almost some would hope for a Reagan-esque uh, hmm. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I don't like to base my voting preferences on lesser evilism, but this time I have to do so. Uh, uh, the notion of a senile, corrupt uh, Beltway insider uh, becoming president and being used as uh, uh, the plaything of the military industrial complex and various other creatures of the swamp is so horrible, is so uh, disgusting that indeed Trump is uh, the obvious alternative, even though he doesn't have I would say a firm inner core. He he does have good intuition. For instance, "Make America Great Again" back four years ago was uh, to me uh, a strike of genius because it doesn't imply uh, American superiority or hegemony. It actually, to my mind, implied uh, the need to put tangible, quantifiable, and rationally negotiable interests of the United States first, which of course excludes global empire. Uh, the liberal media have ridiculed the proposal that he should receive Nobel Peace Prize, but considering the fact that Obama won it for nothing in 2009, we're looking at the first U.S. president not to start a foreign war since Herbert Hoover in 1932. We're looking at the first American president who was able to say that many generals want to wage 
eternal wars in order to provide a rationale for their existence and to enrich the military industrial complex in the obviously deliberate attack of Eisenhower's farewell address. So I'm in favor of Trump, not because I believe that Trump is a great thinker or a great statesman or a lucid political theorist, but because I believe he's a normal human person. He's with all his vanities, with all his idiosyncrasies, someone I can recognize as a normal American. On the other side, what we have is frightening. We have a vampire, a zombie, and then we have his designated vice president, who far from being African-American, as she tries to project herself, is actually a Brahmin from the Indian subcontinent who despises anyone who is not of the caste. Uh, And the whole coalition of interests there, people are politics. Let me tell you very specifically, Michelle Fontroy was Obama's uh, director of policy at the Pentagon. Uh, during the Trump years, she went into consultancy. Now, this is a very important term because the Obama White House said they would not hire lobbyists. But if you're not a lobbyist, if you're a consultant instead, then you're perfectly kosher. What is the difference? I still don't know myself, but Michelle Fontroy increased uh, the de- Department of Defense uh, profits of her consulting firm by 2,000% in two years. Later on, when she moved to a think tank, she got over $4 million, of which 12% was hers, from defense industry. So these people, if they come uh, on uh, Biden's coattails, and of course they will be in charge because Biden is is past it. Biden is just uh, uh, a shell of, of former human. They will make sure that liberally based global hegemony will be the guiding light of America for the next four years. America at the head of the table for climate change, for COVID-19, destructing uh, North Stream 2 uh, gas pipeline, intervening here and there, including the India Pacific Basin, we haven't even touched upon that minefield, to no benefit of the American nation. (coughs) So being pro-Trump, in my case, means being pro-coming home, not starting new wars, but consolidating a deeply divided, tragically divided nation, which is on the road to self-destruction, which needs to be healed and healed not by accepting Black Lives Matter thugs as freedom fighters, but by reinstituting the notion that all lives matter and all laws apply to all Americans equally. This is, this sounds like platitude, I know, but (laughs) in our conversation, we started with foreign affairs, but we came back to domestic basics. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, just the, the beauty with which you describe America's history and its heritage and uh, what we hope to live up to is, is simply fantastic. I know you have a hard stop here. Uh, and I would just ask, uh, you know, for those who have been intrigued by this discussion and are thinking about America's domestic situation, but also uh, the future. Do we go on all of these foreign adventures and have our our young men and even women uh, blood maimed and killed? 
uh, I'd refer you to George Washington's farewell address. Mm -hmm. Take the time to actually read uh, his recommendations for our country. And what you will find is it's very much along the lines of what Sergio has been sharing with us, that preserve the domestic tranquility. We have two oceans to our left and to our right and weak neighbors to our south and our north. Uh, do commerce with everyone. But don't get involved in foreign entanglements. Don't get in treaties with everybody. And uh, overall, again, look out for the domestic tranquility of the U.S. And do not go in in quest of dragons to slay. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more opportunity to discuss both these mega issues and uh, specifics of policy. And uh, I hope we haven't tired our audience too much by dwelling on what to my mind is the existential issue of of the us as we near the presidential election thank you sir, thank you, sir. For those of you who are watching Chronicles Magazine, we put it out each month, and Sergio uh -huh. has a monthly piece uh, in there as well, always giving the insights on uh, the Chronicles blog. You can also read Sergio's uh, pieces there, and then they get republished occasionally on Intellectual Takeout as well. So thank you all uh, for joining us today. Sergio, thank you so much for taking the time. This will definitely not be the last time we have Sergio on. Uh, I could <laughs> actually go for another couple hours of listening to your perspective, and your perspective, which I think is wonderfully unique, and I think something that Amer a lot Americans of all stripes need to hear. So thank you for that, Sergio. My Take pleasure and my privilege. Definitely. Godspeed. <laughs>